using principle of equivalence and for Newtonian limit of general relativity, etc. That we do know what the amplitude is. That is, if I of x2 comma x1, which is the propagator, which is written as a sum over all paths of exponential i over h cross times some quantity which we called action. And I also showed you that this action can be an integral over a Lagrangian L dt. And the form of L we have obtained, we obtained it for a particle in a gravitational field. And then in its uh, non-relativistic limit, it reduces to a form like kinetic energy minus potential energy. All that we have done. Then we also looked at the properties of this action. And we found that if you look at delta A equals 0 with endpoints being fixed, then it gives you an equation which is which we wrote as dp by dt where p is dl by dx dot dp by dt is equal to dl by dx where l is the lagrangian okay then we also found that if you are taking a trajectory which satisfies this equation but think of this action as the uh, function, pure function of the endpoints. Then there is a, there are two relations which we obtained. The first relation was that the momentum can be thought of as ds by, not as action, a, dA by dx which I now want to write it as dx alpha giving you a p alpha. Originally, I would have put a vector symbol here and a vector symbol here. But what we are doing here is alpha is 1, 2, 3. So the, you are taking derivative with respect to each of the coordinate. That gives you the three components of the moment. Then we found in a similar way that dA by dt, this is dA by dx alpha. If you take dA by dt, that gives you minus a quantity which we called Hamiltonian or energy function. And this h was defined as p q dot minus p x dot minus z. So all these we have derived yesterday. Okay. Now we want to proceed further. The next thing we want to do is that, okay, it is one thing to know what this action is, but it is another thing to actually compute the sum. And the question is, uh, how do we do this sum? And what is the final form of G? And without knowing G, we cannot proceed any further. In order to do that, we will be guided by one relation which we wrote down in the first lecture, not in last lecture, but in the first lecture, where we said that the role of G is to propagate an amplitude, which we call the wave function. So psi at x2 was obtained by integrating over d3 x1 G x2 comma x1 psi at x1. I want to remind you again that things like x1 with uh, no appendage stands for events, which means there is a t1, x1, y1, z1. This is a four component object. This is a four component object. This is a four component object. But we are only integrating over d3x. It turns out that this is a very strong constraint on how you have to do this sum may not be apparent, so let me spend some time on that. What does it tell you? What it tells you is that if I give you the wave function at a given point, at a given time, or rather the amplitude to find a particle at a given point at a given time, then I can find everything in the future. I know the evolution of the system. Normally, in classical mechanics, for example, I have to give two pieces of data. I have to give you the position and its time derivative like position and velocity. Here I am not saying I should get, I know, I need to know the psi dot. If you just give me psi, I can propagate it forward. So you can immediately guess ahead that if you are finally going to write down an equation for this psi, differential equation for psi, it is very likely to be first order in time rather than second order in time. 
because you only need to know the uh, psi, you do not need to know the psi dot. If it is second order, then you need to know psi and psi dot, ok. We will see that. More importantly, suppose I do this twice. I go from psi at x1 to some point, let us say intermediate point psi at x, ok. So, let me call this x now. And then from psi at x, I proceed further to psi at x2. So, how will you do that? I have psi at x. So, I multiply it by another g and then I am going to integrate over x. So, that x is going to just multi hit this x and I will have an identity with the g itself. So, it is obvious intuitively, but you can work it out if you want to. That is g at x2 x1 should be equal to integral over d3 x of an intermediate point of g at x2 comma x g at x comma x1. So, what are we saying here? Physically this seems obvious. An amplitude for the particle to propagate from some x1 to x multiplied by the amplitude for it to go from x to x2 with all intermediate points x should be equal to this it for it to propagate from x1 to x2. If we assume that there is a time ordering that uh, t1 is less than this t in between point is less than t2. So, it is propagating forward in time. You can just to show this very clearly you can assume that every g has a theta function that it, it is per 0 it is 1 this quantity is non-zero when the, the time variable of this is larger than the time variable of this, but it is uh, it is going to be zero in the backward. Okay, that is just a notational convenience. There is also one more condition which we can write down from this. Suppose I take t two going to t one limit. This is psi at uh, okay. I rub this off. So let me put this back. So this is t two this depends on t2, this depends on t2. Suppose I take t2 going to t1 limit. Then I am talking about the wave function as a function of x2, but t2 has become t1, but at t1 I know what the wave function is. So, I should get back that result, which means there is also one more condition on g that limit t2 going to t1 of g of x2 comma x1 should be a Dirac delta function in space. I am assuming all of you have a notional familiarity with Dirac delta function, which is essentially unity at this coincident point. It is infinity, but you can think of it as unity. It just takes contribution from that point and it is going to be 0 elsewhere. So, if I take T 2 going to T 1 limit in this, I am going to take T 2 going to T 1 limit in this and you plug in this limit, it becomes a Dirac delta function x2 minus x1 multiplied by psi at x1. If I integrate this over all d3 x1, the property of the Dirac delta function tells you that it, you are going to reproduce psi at the same point x2 at the same time t. So, whatever you do to produce this g by this summation, it has to satisfy these two conditions. And that is not obvious that if you take a bunch of paths and you do the summation in some crazy way, these conditions will be satisfied. So, we want to know what these conditions mean in terms of the paths, ok. So, let us try to understand this condition in terms of the paths first. So, let us, let me, I will, let me try to draw this graphically. So, this is again t, this is again x, all of space. So, you start from some point which is 1 and you are planning to go to this point 2. So, this is this corresponds to t2, this corresponds to t1, but in between I am going to take a particular time value which is uh, t. So, think of this equation, I am translating this equation into graph. So, I am going from t1 to t2 via a point in between at some time t. So, this x has a uh, time variable t associated with it. So, what I am saying is that you take all the paths and all the paths will cut this line at some point. Let us say that the path cut the line here. 
Then I have another path which cuts the line like this, another path which cuts the line like this, etc. So what I am saying is that you sum all the paths which go from here to let us say some intermediate point. So think of paths like this. All the paths which go from here to here and then all the paths which go from here to here. Okay. So all the paths which go from here to here, some point, this point, let us call it x, is going to give me this object. All the paths which go from this to this is going to give me this object. So the product of these two gives you the res net result of all the paths here and all the paths here. But this point could be anywhere in this space. I can, I can keep translating it. That should take care of all the paths because all the paths can be divided into paths by where it is cutting here, summing here, summing there and then integrating over there. That is what that graphically tells us. So it seems to make lot of sense that uh, you sum over all the paths here, then sum over all the paths there, and then you do this, and then you are going to get it, and it looks obvious. There is a catch. The catch is the following. Let me now draw for you another path. So this is the t-axis. This is again 1. This is again 2. Think of this path. Okay. Now you are in trouble. What this path does is that at an intermediate time, I don't even know what this means. See, all along we have been saying that the particle is going from here by some path. But there is only one particle. Now what this means is that here there was one particle it started moving like this. Here also there is one particle, it came like this. But in between at this time, there, are, there is particle here, there is a particle here, and there is a particle here. One particle has become three particles. So in terms of dynamical degrees of freedom, if I say that one particle has three degrees of freedom, suddenly I have nine degrees of freedom. So you cannot have that. In the sense that, if this has to be correct, such paths has to be excluded. So we are not going to sum over all the paths, even though we keep saying sum over all paths, sum over all paths. We are only going to take paths which cuts at any intermediate t only once. What it means is that all the paths has to go forward in time. So if you take this path, this path is actually going backward in time, in this part. Okay, as time goes forward, it is going backward in time. This further means is that we are treating time and say space separately. So if I have drawn a similar kind of a diagram in x, y plane, there is nothing wrong in a part, if I want a particle to go from here to here, there is nothing wrong in a particle following a path like this, where it goes back and forth in x direction, or in y direction, or in z direction. But it can't go back and forth in the time direction. So such paths we are ignoring. Now, this is what leads to non-relativistic quantum mechanics in which this relation holds. But it turns out that you cannot do this in this way by excluding these paths when it comes to relativity. Suppose you have a particle which has to be described fully relativistically. Then in such a case, a path is defined in terms of the time shown by a clock which is attached to the particle. So you can have a particle which is going along this path with a clock carrying it, the clock time will always keep increasing, which will be a parameter along this path. But the coordinate time t will decrease in this region and increase in this region. So this is like saying that suppose you have a curve y is equal to f of x. This is the most elementary notion of a curve in geometry and it is also a very wrong notion. It is wrong notion because if I have a function which is like this, this is a perfectly well-defined function in the space. I can draw this curve. Okay, I cannot represent it like this because at a given point of, uh, or I think it cannot be represented by a single valued function like this. At a given value of x, it should have different values of y. Okay, 
So a much nicer way to describe curves in space is to say x is equal to some x of lambda and y is equal to y of lambda where lambda is a parameter. This is a more general description. Instead of giving, eliminating lambda and saying x as a function of y. So when you do that, there is a value of lambda which keeps increasing, it keeps increasing, keeps increasing and like this. The value of lambda when the curve first cuts it here and then cuts it here are different. Okay? But the curve will remain be the same. The simplest example of this is a circle. Circle is y is equal to square root of a square minus x square. But instead of doing it like that, you can give circle as y is equal to a cos theta and x is equal to a sin theta. Theta can keep going round in the circle, but you will only draw one circle, you won't draw millions of circles. Okay? So, in the same way, when you go to relativity, a curve is represented by t as a function of some tau, which is the proper time shown by the clock, and x, y, z as a function of the proper time tau. Rather than giving t a, x as a function of t, which is what we are usually used to. It is like y equals f of x versus y is equal to y of lambda and x is equal to x of lambda. When you do that, a path like this is perfectly allowed. The tau will keep, uh, the, uh, the proper time tau will keep increasing and decrease, increasing along this line, while the coordinate time will increase, decrease and then increase. Okay? So such paths we are excluding in non-relativistic mechanics. If time permit, towards the end of the course, I will explain to you how this is incorporated in relativity and what modifications it changes. So, we are only going to study paths which are always going uh, forward in time. And then, of course, there is this question as to, all right, you have restricted to these paths, how do I actually sum it? Now, it turns out that for a general system, that is a particle in a potential, like uh, take a gravitational field, we know that it is uh, kinetic energy minus potential energy. If that potential has some crazy form, then it turns out that doing this sum is extremely complicated. So, we will take a shortcut. What we will do is that instead of this integral uh, form of this relation, we will write down a differential equation for psi. And then all the machinery of partial differential equations is available to us to solve for that. Yeah. So which part you showed last, like uh, this one? Right. Is it, no, not that one, uh, below one? Yeah, right. This is it possible? Uh, is it possible meaning? Like at the same time, there will be two possibilities. No, here I was, okay. First here I was talking about y as a function of x in just a piece of paper. Yeah. There I can certainly draw this curve. Okay, there are convolutes of various functions which will give you this curve. But physically okay, physically if you are thinking of it as a particle which is moving, again it is perfectly possible because a particle is moving like this and it is revisiting the same point at two different times. But that point where it is revisiting, there, if I consider the trajectory of that particle, it right. can go uh, like by two In two different ways. So it is not going to be decided by a dynamical equation where the trajectory is completely fixed by x and x dot. That is correct. That is if you are talking about Newton's loss of motion where you have x and x dot and once x and x dot are given at a point the trajectory is completely fixed. At that point in one case it, the x is given and x dot is in this direction. Next time when it comes it is not going to have the same thing if the external conditions are not changing. See, there is a force acting on the particle. So, the particle is moving like this. At this point of time, at this position, the force was giving it a kick in this direction. It went like this and came back. By that time, I have switched my force so that the time dependent force is going to give a kick elsewhere. Okay? So, the external force, if it is time dependent, such a trajectory can happen even in Newtonian mechanics. If it is a closed system in Newtonian mechanics where things depend only on x and x dot, it is cannot happen, but there is nothing which excludes it in a time dependent potential. Because the force can be different at uh, different times when the particle comes back to the same point. Okay? So this is like if you have a, you can have a particle orbiting let us say in a magnetic field, it keeps orbiting, then I suddenly switch on an electric field at a given time. So it might have come to this point several times, but this time when it comes, I have switched on an electric field, it will go in a different trajectory. Okay. Fine. So, so, so the loop kind of trajectories in space-time, yeah. that can be possible only if the particle is accelerating. I 
Will this this curve is definitely accelerated curve? If it is not accelerating, it's a straight line. Okay, but remember that we are supposed to take all paths when you are summing. The non-accelerating paths is a trivial subset. Almost all paths will be accelerating, even in non-relativistic. Uh, even when you are studying non-relativistic quantum mechanics of a free particle, when you are summing over paths, you are summing over all paths. Okay, fine. So what I am now going to do is to show that this psi satisfies a particular differential equation. Now in order to do that, first you notice that suppose I have some linear differential operator. Okay, so there is, there is some operator D which acting on G, we will treat it as a function of the second variable. The first variable we will keep as fixed. So we are just going to look at the this x or as the variable. So this is going to depend on that t and that x corresponding to this. This operator acting on g, suppose it is 0. Suppose I find you such an operator. Then it immediately follows that that same operator acting on psi will give me 0 because when I operate on it with psi, it is just going to go inside. This is only x1 and it will operate on that and it will give me 0. Right? So this is what I wanted to show you. What I will show you, the final result let me write down first because there is a bit of algebra involved. I will show that i h cross d by dt minus the Hamiltonian h which is a function of p and q but we will replace p by minus i uh, d by dx. Let me do one dimension just for convenience. This is partial with respect to x and leave x as it is. This operator acting on g treated as a function of the second variable is going to be 0. This is what I will prove for you. Okay? Now there are different ways of proving it and there is one rigorous way which I will throw in in the assignment where what you do is that you consider g at one time t and you look at it at a t plus epsilon. So you know how g changes with respect to time and then you manipulate them and you show that it satisfies this equation. Here I am going to take a shortcut. Okay, I will explain to you why it is a shortcut and there is a bit of a catch in that particular approach but the final result is the same. So I might as well save time by taking the shortcut and also the shortcut is a bit cute. So I will do it like that in the class. But uh, it is not completely rigorous and I will explain to you why it is not completely rigorous after deriving it. So this is what I want to prove. So let us start with uh, all the operators which are appearing in it. So first thing I want to do is that I want to compute. Uh, remember that this is the definition of g. This g is supposed to satisfy this equation. Okay, that is what we want to show. So I want to calculate what is i h cross d by dt acting on this taken through this and all that sort of a thing. But before we do that, I want to first prove a more elementary result. And in fact, that elementary result is also very nice. The result is the following. What does the sum mean? The sum means that as far as things are going forward, hereafter we will only look at paths which are going forward. The, as long as we consider paths which are all going forward in time, here I am summing over all such paths. Okay? Now suppose I have a set of paths which are given by x of t. Now I consider another set of paths which are x of t plus y of t, it can be even finite, but instead of that I will just put delta x of t, which is, to which something is added. Now whether I sum over all these x of t or whether I sum over all these, it is the same. Because a path which is listed here, x of t plus some function, will also be there in this, provided delta x vanishes at the end point. Because I am only studying paths which are vanishing at the end point and it must be forward going. Except for that, I could have summed over this or summed over this. Which means that if I change path from x of t to delta x of t in this whole thing, 
Nothing should change. I should get back the same propagator. Which means delta G should be 0 under that change. And that gives us a condition. So delta G is equal to 0. I will write 0 first. Is going to be summation delta of e to the i that quantity. So that is going to be i over h cross delta a e to the i a over h cross. But we know what is delta a. Delta v a we have computed in the previous lecture. It had this, this part and the endpoint contribution, right? If you let me call this quantity, okay, it doesn't matter in there may be a sign issue, but this is all right. Let me call this quantity E of L. E of L is called the Euler function of the Lagrangian. So it is d by dt of this uh, dl by dx dot and then minus dl by dx dot. Okay? You can either take E of L or minus E of L, it does not matter. I think it is probably better to take minus, that is more conventional, this quantity. Okay? Then what we know is that the change in the action was integral this E delta x dt plus boundary terms. Are you with me? Because this is what we derived in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we explicitly varied A. Then we found that we have this quantity times delta x. Okay? That quantity is what I have now called E of L. So there is an E of L times delta x dt. Then we said that if delta x is arbitrary, then E has to vanish, etc., etc. That is how we got the Euler-Lagrange equation. So this E is for Euler. It is the Euler function of that Lagrangian. Okay? So what we now know is that if I am going to vary this delta A, the change in delta A is just going to be given by this uh, E times delta x. Right? But delta x is arbitrary and the left hand side is 0 which immediately gives me the result, i over h cross I can ignore, the Euler function of the Lagrangian, e to the i, a over h cross, summed over all paths is equal to 0. This is a, by itself is a very amusing result. Just think about it. We know that for a classical path, this e vanishes. Okay? That we know because that is the definition of classical path. Here we are not studying classical path. We are taking all paths. So you take any given path and you compute this EFL. You will get some value. That will not be 0. It will be 0 only for the classical path. For all other paths, you will keep getting some value for EFL. What it tells you is that if you do some kind of an averaging of this, I could have put on the denominator summation over e to the i a x. So think of this as an amplitude averaging. So this is the uh, particular path, the amplitude for a particular path. That is how we started. A for path was this, small a for path. And this is E evaluated for that path, divided by sum over all of these paths. Okay? So this is like an average of this Euler function. That is 0 in any quantum mechanical context. So even though the Euler function is not 0 and it vanishes only in the classical theory, the average of the Euler function when averaged with this amplitude always vanishes. Okay? This is something which we are going to need. That is why I derived it. But as an independent result, this is a nice result to have. Okay. Now let us go and compute what is dg by dt. Because I need this quantity, dg by dt. So how will you do dg by dt? Again, the trick is you first calculate small variations and then you convert if there is a delta t, this will be like dg by dt will be delta of g for a small change delta of t and then you take delta t to the other side to write the derivative. That is how you differentiate things. So I want to compute how this g changes, g in that expression changes, when I change the upper end point t slightly. Remember, this g is, so where is this g? This g is treated as a function of the upper endpoint t and x. So I want to know how g changes when I just change the upper endpoints. Okay. But 
For that we again have to go through the same calculation. So what I will have is summation i over h cross e to the i a by h cross delta of a. But now delta of a is coming because I have changed the upper end point. But of course it will also change path because for every path it is, it is going to hit it in a different way. So you will have for delta a now two contributions. One contribution is this which we have written down. Then you have a contribution coming from the end point. Now the end point contribution we know that end point contribution is going to be minus h. Okay, this is what is coming from the end point. This is what is coming from the uh, all the paths. But this part, so if I write the delta a here as two contributions, the first one will have this EFL, but I just now proved that its average is zero. So I don't have to worry about it. So I just pick up the end point contribution. And if I pick up the end point contribution, I will have dA by dt and that is minus h. Evaluated at the second point, but I will not indicate that. So this is what I get. Yeah. So uh, when you are deriving the, for the first uh, average value of point, point mm -hmm. which is zero, right. why did you not consider the end point? Because, because the here the, the logic was that the delta g vanishes if this x of t and x of t plus delta x of t belongs to the same set. For that delta x has to vanish. Okay. So you get this. Now you multiply by i h cross just for a window dressing. So i h cross goes and the sign changes. So th you get this. This is again an interesting result. If you think of very roughly, it is not completely correct, but suppose you divide this by e to the i a and multiply by e to the i a. What are you going to get? You are getting the average of h multiplied by g. So what it tells you is that i h cross d by dt acting on g, this operator acting on g is like g times the average of the Hamiltonian, okay, which is an interesting result. So you get this. Now you want to do the same thing for special derivative because the special derivatives are coming from inside this. So, but by now you know the trick. If you do this, you will again get dg by dx is going to be summation i over h cross e to the i o i a over h cross delta of a again only the end point is going to contribute end point is going to give you p so you multiply by i and you put a h cross here and this time you put a minus sign on the left hand side so you again get on the right hand side p times this okay so d by i h cross d by dt acting on this propagator is like average of h, i h cross d by dx acting on this is like average of p. Now suppose I do it twice because what I am interested in is to get back to non-relativistic quantum mechanics for which I know what the Hamiltonian is. The Hamiltonian for non-relativistic quantum mechanics we derived in the previous lecture. It is p square by 2m plus a potential function, right? So let me even explicitly write it here. So this is going to be p replaced by this quantity. So this is going to be minus h cross square by 2m dx square. This is p square plus some potential which I will call some capital phi which depends on x. Okay. So I want two derivatives. I have only got one derivative. Now I am going to repeat this process on second. Now when I do that, we will come back to this later on, I am going to assume this p remains constant, which means it is just going to give you a p. So what I will get here is that minus i h cross d by dx, the whole square, which is just this minus h cross square d square by dx square without a 2m. This is going to be equal to average e to the i a over h cross p square. So if I put a 2m here, I can put a 2m here, all right? So, so we are almost done. Finally, of course, there is this phi times g, 
But phi times g makes no difference because phi can be taken in and taken out because there is no variation involved in it. So this immediately tells you that if I take this operator acting on g, I am first going to have i h cross by d t acting on g. That is going to give me this h. That h is going to have p square by 2 m and a v. So v times that g is this term, that v is phi. Phi times g is this term. p square by 2 m, when I replace it, I get this. And that is going into this operator. Therefore, we have proved the result that g satisfies this differential equation. And we originally said that if g satisfies this differential equation, psi should satisfy the same differential equation. So we have derived a differential equation for psi, which is i h cross d psi by d t equals minus h cross square by 2 m. And now if I do it in three dimension, I will get del square psi plus whatever is my potential. I will use v, which is the standard notation, v times psi. Okay. Now, where is the catch? It looks like a very nice and cute result. The catch is that it is not quite correct to assume. Well, actually, it is correct to assume because the result is true. But it is not obvious that when I take this is perfect. This is also perfect. This is also perfect. There is nothing wrong in any of these steps. But when I am taking the second variation of this, I am taking the variation coming from this, but I am not considering the variation from p. So it is like assuming that when I am changing x2, I am not changing p2. So it is a restricted kind of variation, and that needs to be justified. To justify that requires quite a lot of work, so that is why I am not doing it. But the final result is correct, and this is what you will get. Okay? Now, as I said, if one is uncomfortable, one can go back to the nitty-gritty way of solving it. Namely, take this g, take a two infinitesimally separated points in time, and then work the whole thing through, and you will find that it satisfies this differential. Okay. This you will find in Feynman and Hips and in various places. Okay. So I have got this differential equation, and once I have got this differential equation, I am almost home. In the sense that even though it came up from computation of quantities like this, you don't have to really worry about where it came from. Now we can go around solving this equation and we will get everything. At this stage, I want to take an aside because all the, after this, we are going to do more with Schrodinger equation and things like that. And originally, when I talked about it, I said you have to find what is the action for a particular system. Then if it is a particle in a gravitational field, we knew how to find the action. Because general relativity told you how to measure lengths in space time in the presence of gravitational field. Using that, we could find the action. And then it had a form kinetic energy minus potential energy. And I also told you not to take it seriously because this is the only system for which Lagrangian is kinetic energy minus potential energy. In general, it is a much more complicated system. right? So we did that. But we also talked in the first lecture about dynamical variables for the electromagnetic field. So what happens in electromagnetic field? What is the action for the electromagnetic field? What is the Schrodinger equation for the electromagnetic field? They also exist. It's identical to what we have done. So I want to spend a moment connecting these two things up. So in the case of electromagnetic field, now we are going to have a problem because A denotes vector potential and the action. But when it comes to action for electromagnetic field, I will use some calligraphic A. Okay? Just don't get confused with two A's referring to two different things. In the case of electromagnetic field, what we found was that if you have an electric field which is a function of T and X, and magnetic field, which is a function of t and x. I can work better in Fourier space in terms of, let us say, E k of t, where I have Fourier transformed over x. So E k of t, e to the i k dot x, d3 k is going to give you this quantity. So these are related by Fourier. Similarly for b k, similarly for a k, etc. Then in Fourier space, we also had a relation that E k of t was minus A k of t, that is A k dot, where A is the uh, uh, vector potential. And B k at any time t 
is i k cross a k. This is just b being equal to curl of a. Curl becomes i k operator with a cross product in the Fourier space. I hope you are again with me. This we did in the first lecture. Okay. And we also had the condition that the a k is divergence free. Divergence of a we took to be 0. That means k dot a k is equal to 0. So, k and a k are perpendicular to each other. With all these, we showed that the dynamical variables here satisfies the differential equation a k double dot uh, plus k square c square which we called omega square. So, let me call it omega k square omega k square a k is equal to 0. This was also done in the first lecture. Now, what we want to do this is all from Maxwell's equation. This is just the content of free Maxwell's equation. What we want to do is to write down an action principle. Now, originally in the case of particle in a free particle or a particle in a gravitational field, I used some general prescription to obtain the action principle and then we wrote down the uh, equations of motion. Here we are doing it in reverse. We already know the equation of motion. We finally, we better get Maxwell's equation which is this. So, what action will give you this? That is easy because we know what the equations given by the action are that is going to be this is equal to 0 and the Lagrangian has to be kinetic energy minus potential energy. This is just a non-relativistic harmonic oscillator. So, I can just write down the potential energy for the harmonic oscillator, kinetic energy for the harmonic oscillator and that will give you the action for this particular k. Right? So, what will that be? The Lagrangian for this particular k for the degree of freedom labeled by this k will be there can be a constant. So, uh, let me say proportional to half the Lagrangian for the oscillator that is kinetic energy term which is a k dot square then minus potential energy term which is omega k square a k square. There is a slight complication. The complication is that your A which is a vector potential in real space is a real quantity. So, if you Fourier transform a real quantity you will get a complex number and the complex number will be related that A star of k will be A f minus k. So, this A k's are actually complex coordinates and we do not like oscillators with complex coordinates. So, what we will do is to take the real part of it and imaginary part of it. Both of them will satisfy the same equation. So, you can you can call let us say q k alpha where this uh, or, or rather I will use the same notation. I will just assume that the real and imaginary parts are taken which means that there is a summation over real and imaginary parts as well which will change these squares to modular squares. This is what the Lagrangian will be, right? The action will be an integral over this, integral over time of this quantity. But what is this? Oh, this is a simple form. If you take that LK, that LK is going to be, uh, again ignoring the proportionality signs, it is half AK dot square. What is AK dot square? That is just EK square. So, that is EK square then minus omega square a k square, omega square was k square c square ok. Now, the if you take this and if you compute what is going to ok, there is a c factor which is making thing here, I am sorry this should be 1 by c a dot. So, this is e k square times c square because E and B if it has the same dimension in my notation then this should have C uh, A's derivative with respect to a length. So, there is a D by D T and a C. So, I had to put a C here. So, which means that when I am computing A k dot square it is C square times this quantity and similarly when you take this there is a C square which I have taken outside here. Then I have k square times A k square. What is k square times A k square? 
So this here what you are going to get is that there is a k cross a k, but I told you k and a are perpendicular to each other. So when I take the magnitude square, it is just k square a k square, which is just b k square. So this is going to be minus b k square. You had a question? Yeah. So like all these things are dependent on J's transformation, which we take in uh, divergence yes. of a is equals to zero. If Correct. we don't take that thing, right. so all these things. It will still work out. This gauge transformation is used as long as there is no matter. That is, I am talking about only free electromagnetic field. For free electromagnetic field, if you work it out in any gauge, the extra terms will go away and you will end up getting exactly the same result. And if there are sources? Uh, if there are sources, then you have to do a little bit more job because there is a degree of freedom of electromagnetic field which is given by the Coulomb degree of freedom and that is tied to the source. So you have to eliminate that. And you have to just take the propagating degrees of freedom and the propagating degrees of freedom will satisfy this relation. It is a little bit more complicated. If, if we will do it in towards the last lecture because we have to study quantum theory of radiation. At that time we will do it with sources. Okay. So this is just to illustrate that whatever I have done here is not something special to non-relativistic quantum mechanics. That is the whole idea because the whole philosophy of the thing was this is, this is a law of nature. And there is no, nothing in physics which we know which is not covered by this equation, okay? including electromagnetic field. So electromagnetic field is given as an illustration. So you have this quantity and it is Ek square minus Bk square. Now what is Ek square? This is of course again because they are complex numbers you are talking about it as smooth square. Now Ek square is Ek dotted with Ek. Ek is the Fourier transform. So you take the square of the Fourier transform and you have that quantity here, but the square of the Fourier transform, whether you are doing it in Fourier space and integrating over all k, or whether you are doing it in real space, you should get the same result. That is, I have this LK for a given k. Now let us consider the full system. So the full system will be this integrated over d3k over 2 pi the whole cube. So that will be this integrated over d3k over 2 pi the whole cube. What we have got is an ek mod square d3k upon 2 pi the whole cube. So there is actually a theorem called Parseval's theorem, but it is absolutely trivial to work out in two steps from the Fourier transform. That this is the same as taking the real space e and integrating over ordinary uh, d3x. Exponential Which exponential? No, that will go away. That is the whole point. What Parseval's, okay, let me just work it out for you. What happens is, suppose you have a function f of x, which you write as integral f of k e to the i k dot x, or kx in this case, is the uh, simple one dimensional case. Then if you take f f star, f is real, so it doesn't matter, but if you take mod f square, what you will be doing here is a uh, fk e to the i k x, then its star which is f star of p e to the minus i p x, then you are going to have a dk dp 2 pi the whole square. Now if I integrate this over x, I am integrating these two over x. So you will get a direct delta function on k minus p and that is going to give you mod of k square, okay? So whether I do the integral in real space or in Fourier space doesn't make any difference. As a result of which you will end up getting half c square, it doesn't mean much because there can be other constants in front, integral over d3x of e square in real space minus b square. This is the total Lagrangian. But if you want to get the action, you have to take this quantity and integrate over dt as well. So the action for the electromagnetic field will be this integrated over dt, which I can write nicely as d4x. Okay. So just starting from Maxwell's equations and using our formalism, we know what the action for electromagnetic field is. 
In principle, I can play the same game. I can put this action here, and then I can try to sum over all parts. And that is horribly complicated. So the easier thing to do is to decompose the action into harmonic oscillators. For each oscillator, you just sum over the paths. So this harmonic oscillator behaves like a non-relativistic particle. So even though the system which we are studying is fully relativistic, we have mapped it into a non-relativistic quantum mechanical system. What about the Schrodinger equation, wave function, etc.? Same thing goes. So here I have the wave function for each oscillator labeled by k. So the full wave function of the electromagnetic field will be the product over all k, the wave function, let us call it phi k or small psi k, which depends on a k and time of course. What does this satisfy? This satisfies the same Schrodinger equation which we have written down somewhere. Where did we write down? Yeah. It satisfies this, this equation. There is no m here because the mass is unity for this system. This uh, v is going to be something like k square c square half. So if you solve this harmonic oscillator system, you know the solutions. Then you can solve for the quantum electrodynamics, free quantum electrodynamics. You have quantized the electromagnetic field. You can already see where photons come from. If you, we haven't done it, we will do it in great detail. But you all know that if you quantize a harmonic oscillator, you get equally spaced energy levels. And the energy levels are labeled by n, some integer. So in this particular case, if you take those stationary states, then each of these psi k will have an n k. And the total energy of this system will be summation over all k. Energy of each mode, each mode will be half h cross the frequency k times that number n k plus half. So when the number n k changes by 1 upwards or downwards, the energy of the system will change by this h cross omega, sorry, no, two, half need not come to h. So you, the thing will change by h cross omega. You think of this as a system in which there are n k photons, each with energy h cross omega k. So when k n changes by 1, you are either absorbing energy or you are emitting energy. So the photon picture, the number of photons and the particles being created and destroyed, etc., all correspond to energy levels of the harmonic oscillator, which are labeled by n. The only extra thing is that for each k, there is an energy level. This is what we will take up for detailed study when we do quantum theory of radiation. But I just wanted to give you a glimpse that whatever we have done, is applicable not for just a particle, free particle in with a potential. You can also do electromagnetic field exactly by this method. Okay. Now let us go further and let us look at this uh, Schrodinger equation and study this a little bit more uh, closely. Sir, yeah. Sir, can you please again explain how did you write the complete wave Okay. So what we have got here. The dynamical degree of freedom of electromagnetic field has been converted into this set of AKs. One for uh, every mode labeled by this K. But they are not talking to each other. So all of them are independent. So it is like you having several particles and all the particles are behaving independently. So the wave function for the full system is the wave function for any one of them multiplied again and again and again. Suppose you have two or three particles and these particles are not talking to each other and uh, we don't worry about statistics and all that. Then it is psi 1 of x1 into psi 2 of x2 into psi 3 of x3. That is the total amplitude for a particular configuration. That is what I have done there. Okay. Fine. So now, uh, uh, But there is uh, any restriction on the K? Restriction on? Uh, restriction on K how many K? But K is infinite. infinite. So there is k is a vector in a space, in the Fourier space. It is just normal Fourier transform, what you have studied in your BSc. So k is just a vector. So the product is actually an infinite product. And even when you are summing over, there are infinities and all that, which has to be sorted out separately. That is the major difference between quantum field theory and quantum mechanics. Because in quantum mechanics, we are dealing with finite number of degrees of freedom. But when you take a relativistic system, you have to deal with infinite number of degrees of freedom. Now there is again an extremely simple reason why this happens. It is not mysterious and it is also unavoidable. 
The reason is something which we had already seen. I need to know what I can rub off. I think I can rub off this. Let me just go through that for one minute. Because this is a connection which you should be able to appreciate with what has been taught already. See, we said that if you are talking about sum over paths, and this is t and this is x, first event, second event, and I drew this path. This path should be considered when you are studying a relativistic system. There is no way of getting out of that. So this path tells you that there are three degrees of freedom at this intermediate time. That is, to describe the system, you need three degrees of freedom, even though you thought it was only one degree of freedom. Right? But you also have to study this path. Now you probably need 10 degrees of freedom. Okay? And I can have these paths wiggling as many times as I want, which means that at any given time t, I need in my hand infinite number of degrees of freedom to describe a relativistic system. So a system with infinite number of degrees of freedom labeled by that vector k is called a field. So you, have, you use a field theoretic description because this picture tells you that you need it. You need infinite number of degrees of freedom in between. Okay? So again, there is nothing very mysterious about it. Everything can be understood from what we have done so far. Yeah? Is there any condition where we can't write a psi as a multiplication of... Oh, well, if these two particles are interacting with each other, each other you can't do that. Suppose there are two particles which are interacting with each other, then the wave function of the full system is not the product of the wave function of these two. You are assuming that they are all independent, each k evolves independently. Okay? Sir, yeah. uh, in the expression of energy, you wrote the factor of 1 by 2. Mm -hmm. k varies from 0 to infinity. Mm -hmm. Then what about this vector? This vector goes on infinity. This vector or this vector or which vector are you talking about? 1 by 2. This 1 by 2, that is not a vector. Right. Then, uh, then that half will contribute. Yeah. That is, if you take a system with nk equals 0, which is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, you put all the oscillators in its ground state, and you will find what is the energy that will be h cross omega k times half, integrated over all k, that is infinite. So the vacuum state of the electromagnetic field in this picture has infinite amount of energy, and there has to be a way of regularizing it. This we will do when we do quantum theory of radiation. But the simple answer is you just subtract it out. Because the Hamiltonians are defined only with respect to a constant. So in this particular case, you can get away with it by subtracting that half. Okay? And only changes in the energy will be observable. Yeah? It's a small doubt. So suppose I have a non-relativistic field. Mm -hmm. No, non-relativistic field will also have infinite degrees of freedom, but most of the non-relativistic fields are an approximation to something else. Either it comes in conden condensed matter physics where you already have some other degrees of freedom which are finite, and then you are using a non-relativistic field to describe it, in which case it is finally finite degrees of freedom, or it is a fully relativistic system which you are studying in a non-relativistic limit. So depending on the context, it can be finite or infinite. There is no such thing called relativistic quantum mechanics. There is only quantum field theory. So we will see that when we go further into probabilistic interpretation, etc., all these works only in the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. It will not work. There is no such thing as a wave function for a relativistic particle. There is a wave function for an electromagnetic field, or rather a wave functional for an electromagnetic field, but there is no wave function for the photon. Okay? So if you have a fully relativistic particle, it cannot be described in terms of a wave function. Because again, it is all contained in this. Suppose I take an electron and I take a positron. You know that they can annihilate and become photons. So suppose I write, they can annihilate even with almost near zero velocity. So it is all non-relativistic. You take a non-relativistic electron and a non-relativistic positron and let them annihilate. Originally, you would have described non-relativistic electron by a Schrodinger equation non-relativistic positron by a Schrodinger equation, suddenly you find that there are, there are no electrons and no positrons. So you don't even know what to do. So if the number is not conserved, and in relativistic uh, situations the number is not conserved, 
the quantum mechanical description fails. So saying relativistic quantum mechanics is a bit of an oxymoron. Of course, textbooks do that, but it is always in an approximation. Okay. Now, let me proceed further with the properties of this Schrodinger equation. In particular, I want to take up one particular property. All along we said that when you are doing this sum, if there is a path which satisfies this particular differential equation, that path is going to sort of stick out. Okay? That path is going to stick out. Therefore, this is the classical trajectory and we have got the classical mechanics. If you think carefully about it, we haven't done any of that. There is a bit of a problem here. The problem is that, well, okay, you have the sum over paths and then you are going to approximate it by saying that one path stands out. Then you will still get a propagator. And when you take that propagator, multiply by SI and integrate over all of them, you will still have a wave function. But a wave function is not a classical trajectory. So you still have some kind of a approximate wave function, an approximate solution to that Schrodinger equation. But how do you get the trajectories out of it? It turns out that this is extremely beautiful and it explains things which can be derived in only very complicated way in normal classical mechanics. So this is again a second example I am giving you where a more exact theory is more beautiful and a lot simpler, lot simpler than that. You will see that. So let me just explain that to you. To do that, let us go back to this equation. We know that this equation has the same physical content as this because we have derived on from the other. So if you want to take h cross going to zero limit, you might as well take this equation and see what happens to it when h cross goes to zero, right? What happens to the solutions of this equation when h cross goes to zero? h cross appears as a parameter here. So we just want to study it when h cross is very small. Now, what you would have normally guessed is that if I have a wave function, you probably can write this as a, you know, zeroth order wave function plus a wave function which is first order in h cross with some suitable dimensions. Then you have a wave function which is h cross square times psi 2, etc. I am just writing it formally. Then you plug it into the Schrodinger equation and you equate coefficients of uh, same powers of h cross. Then you should get uh, the solution and approximate solution. If you try this, you will get manifest nonsense. Okay. Now the, in fact, if you didn't get nonsense, you will be in trouble because if you throw away all these, you have a wave function in classical physics because there is no h cross here and there is a wave function. So at least this has to vanish. And then there are no h cross dependent term. It comes with h cross square. So this also has to vanish. And then if you try to do fix this, you will find that you cannot fix this. So this is because this is not the right way to approximate this. And I want to show you what is the right way to approximate this. So to do that, I will first write the wave function. Wave function is a complex number. So I will write the wave function with a amplitude and phase. So let me write it as r exponential i. The phase I will write as something upon h cross times s. This is coming from our picture that the amplitude itself is like this. So when you are doing that solution, here this is not approximate. I'm just, this is a wave equation. It is a complex equation. A compl it is a wave equation for a complex function psi. There is explicit i sitting here. So it's a complex equation. And this i can be always written as r e to the i s where s is real and r is real. Okay? So in fact, this equation has exactly the same physical content as this with the equations for r and s separate. So you plug this into it and then you equate real and imaginary parts. Okay, that is an elementary exercise, so I won't I won't work through it here. So if you do that, you will get the following equations. First you will get ds by dt plus 1 by 2m ds by dx the whole square plus v equals you will get something which is h cross square by 2m r double prime by r. Prime denote derivative with respect to x and dot will denote uh, uh, derivative with respect to time. Then you will get one more equation for r which I will write down but we don't need this. 
it is d by dt of r square plus 1 by m s prime r square prime equals 0. We will not need this, but I just wrote it down for completeness. So you should verify that. All that you have to do is to take this equation, plug it into this, and then equate real and imaginary parts of this. So you get two equations. So these two equations have exactly the same physics as this single equation. But there is one major difference between these two. That is also an, ad it is a major advantage when you are doing computation and it is sort of a major headache when it comes to the conceptual foundations of quantum mechanics. This equation is linear in xi. So if you have one solution xi1 and another solution psi2, then A psi1 plus B psi2 is also a solution. This equation is not linear in R and S, it is non-linear. And linear equations are nicer to handle, that is why we like this, okay. But this is something very peculiar. Non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the fundamental equation of non-relativistic quantum mechanics is linear in the unknown which we are going to solve for. This does not happen in classical mechanics. So in that sense, quantum mechanics is simpler than classical mechanics in the sense that the equation you are dealing with is a linear equation inside. The problem with this is that suppose I have a wave function describing, let us say, my mobile phone sitting here. And there is a solution to, I write down the Schrodinger equation for the mobile phone, thinking of it as a quantum mechanical system. So it is localized there and I get one solution. Then I take the mobile phone and I keep it here and I can have a solution which is localized here. Because if I have a solution localized there, by shifting I have a solution localized there. Both of them are solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Which means A times that plus B times this is also a solution. So in that solution, what does it represent? It represents the amplitude for the mobile phone to be either here or there, okay? That is a bit weird because we have never seen mobile phones being either here or not there. So in the classical limit, somehow the superposition principle has to give way and only one set of them should emerge. We will, we will have occasion to talk about it on Monday in the next lecture, but right now that is one issue because of the linearity. So linearity is not always a blessing, okay? So this comes just because of the linearity. But you have these equations, so you have got up to this point. Now we want to study the H cross going to zero limit. The reason we did this was that you can now get a much better way of doing the approximation. And as I said, this, is, this goes for a ride in this entire uh, procedure, so I'm only going to concentrate on the first equation. What we will do is that instead of doing this, I'm going to approximate S instead of psi as S naught plus H cross S plus H cross square S2, etc. Okay? So what have I done? There is an S over H cross here. When I plug this expansion into it, my leading term is S naught divided by H cross, which is non-analytic in H cross. It sort of oscillates very rapidly when H cross goes to zero, all right? Then there are remaining terms. In fact, we will only need S naught. So there is one term which will just change the capital R because that is going, the H cross will cancel out of that and that will just change capital R. And then there is a H cross square term which are going to higher order correction, etc. We will concentrate on S naught. Why is it that classical mechanics uh, comes out in this procedure much nicer, as we will see, compared to the original thing? That has to again to do with the fact that H cross going to zero limit is like the uh, iconal approximation in optics. The ray optics has to come from wave optics, so something like a wavelength has to go to zero, and so the H cross goes to, has to go to zero in the phase. Fine. But where are the trajectories? Suppose we do actually solve, right? we plug it in and laboriously solve this equation, then you are going to get again an approximate psi, right? Where I would have an approximate form for R and an approximate form for S. How do I get a trajectory out of it? The trajectory emerges exactly the same way the trajectory emerges in terms of the propagator. What is going to happen is that when you are solving for this, let me first describe it in the abstract and then I will tell you exactly what happens in a concrete example. So when you solve for this, this, these are differential equations, they will pick up constants of integration. 
So what you are going to get is that this S will depend on some constant. Let me call this lambda. Well, lambda is probably a bad notation. Let me call this mu. Okay. So you are going to have a wave function psi which is going to depend on some r. r will also depend on mu but that is not so important as the phase e to the i over h cross or exponential i over h cross s which depends on mu where mu is some constant which comes out of uh, solving this equation. But I just now told you that the equation is linear. So if I have this I can sum over all mu or if mu is continuous I can integrate over all mu. This is also a solution because uh, solutions with different mu all uh, individually are solution. So their sum is also a solution. Now see what happens here. When you are doing this sum it is exactly like the sum in the path integral except that now we understand what this sum is. It is just an integration or summing over the constant. If I change mu slightly this s of mu will again oscillate very widely except in those cases where ds by d mu is 0. The same as the argument as before. So this s is going to be a function of t and x originally because this s is going to satisfy a differential equation in t and x. So this is equal to 0 is going to give you this derivative is going to be some function of t, x and mu this is equal to 0. That is going to give a curve x of t parameterized by mu. So for that particular constant you get a curve and that is how your trajectory comes up. Okay? So let us see what this gives. So in order to do that I have to redo this for a specific example. So I will I will just uh, try it out for a, for a case like this for a single particle approximation. So we are going to plug it in and look at the lowest order. So lowest order there will be an s naught here and an s naught here and this is h cross square is higher order so I will ignore the right hand side. So the equation satisfied by s is ds by dt plus 1 by 2m s prime square plus v equals 0. This is a partial differential equation for S and there is a standard trick to solve these equations. You assume that S has an ansatz which is of this form minus E let us say T minus T naught. It depends on T linearly then plus some function F which depends on X. So you plug this in. So ds by dt is going to give me a minus E. So take that minus E to the right hand side. So I will get E minus V. on the right hand side ds by dt is gone and you multiply by this 2m. So you get a 2m here then you take a square root. So you get this s prime and s is just an integral of this. So this is f prime of course the other term does not contribute. So your f is going to be integral over dx indefinite integral square root of 2m into e minus v. Good. So this is S0. I won't I won't keep putting the label, but this is zero order solution. So what does that mean? That means I have found my wave uh, wave function to the lowest order in h cross. It is 1 by h cross times this quantity. How is the trajectory supposed to come? The trajectory has to supposed to come because I am going to sum this over the constant which is appearing in the integration, the constant which is appearing is E that came out of the solving the partial differential equation. So I am going to sum it over all E for the general solution and the trajectory will emerge when this thing is stationary with respect to E. So I have to now compute ds by dE and equate it to 0. So ds by dE here will give me minus and I put it on the left hand side. This is equal to differentiation of this with respect to E. So I get first 1 upon square root of 2m into E minus V of x. Then derivative of that which is 2m 
then e. Uh, there is a half. Yeah, half of this is whole to the minus half into this. Okay? So this is what you get. What does this mean? Well, to understand what this means, convert this back. Of course, if, if you want to just find the trajectory, you plug in V of x, integrate this, you get t as a function of x, invert it, you get x as a function of t, you have found the trajectory. That is going to be the classical trajectory. But in order to see that this is correct, what you can do is to compute dx by dt. You do this by first taking dt by dx and then inverting and squaring. So dt by dx and you square, you have inverted and squared, then you multiply by this m, because this is going to give you a square root of m. So you get m by 2 and then plus v is equal to e. You just check my algebra, this should work out, assuming all the calculations are correct. But this you understand. It just tells you that the kinetic energy of the particle plus the potential energy of the particle is equal to the total energy. This is the parameter E which we introduced in this equation happens to be the total energy. So we have reproduced the classical trajectory. But let us just look at it a bit more carefully as to what we did. What we did is the following. When we solve for this yes, what did we solve? We solved that differential equation here, which is ds by dt plus h cross square upon 2m ds by dx the whole square plus v is equal to 0. That differential equation is nothing but ds by dt plus take the Hamiltonian and you replace the p in the Hamiltonian by ds by dx and you leave x alone equal to 0. So if p was, uh, h was p square by 2m plus v, then p square by 2m would have become ds by dx the whole square upon 2m plus v of x equal to 0. You solve this. When you solve this, you found as to be a function of s of t comma x with a parameter e. This is what we did here. Right? You are with me. Okay? So you got this. Then we said that ds by de is equal to 0. then you got the classical trajectory. So this is the fastest way to solve a classical mechanics problem. For example, in general relativity, somebody will do this in the next semester, you will have to study, for example, orbits of particles in black hole spacetime. If you write down the differential equation like this, or the conservation law, or a differential equation, d square x by dx square, dt square is equals minus v prime or something, and try to integrate that, that is almost always a messier route compared to writing down the analog of this equation, solving for this function, yes, and then taking the derivative of that and equating it to 0. Now, some of you would have studied this in MFC, and it would have been called something called Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Okay? Now, if you go back and think about it, you will see how ridiculously simple it is when you approach it from the exact theory, namely quantum mechanics. So, Hamilton-Jacobi equation is something which is, a, which is, I would say, is a 20th century physics which fell into an earlier century by accident. Because you don't need Hamilton-Jacobi equation in classical physics. And in order to justify this, you have to do enormous amount of machinery with canonical transformations and generating functions and how you go from one h to another h which is zero. You, you might remember, uh, usually it comes at the fag end of your MSc course, so you might have even skipped it. But if you have studied it, then you will find that the Hamilton-Jacobi equation comes after canonical transformation and generating functions, and there are different kinds of generate. You don't need any of these nonsense. What is actually happening? Nature did not go through canonical transformation because nature is quantum mechanical. So what it does is that there is a Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation has an approximate solution, 
and that approximate solution is parameterized by a function s and to the lowest order that function satisfies this differential equation. Now this differential equation happens to be Hamilton Jacobi equation and this s also happens to be just the classical action. That is because you know that we wrote it down here dA by dt plus h where in h you replace every p by this quantity is exactly this equation. So we do know that this equation, at least you know that A and S satisfy the same equation. So if you choose the correct boundary condition, A and S will become identical. So this S is just a classical action, but neither the action principle nor the uh, value of the classical action or any of these things really have meaning in cl classical physics because classical physics, they are just tools. But in quantum mechanics, they acquire a life of their own. The reason up to this point, then you have solved for this, and the reason you put this is equal to zero is purely quantum mechanical. It is just that the phases are going to oscillate away to glory. Okay? Now, if you are interested just as a curiosity and if you are good with Mathematica, you should try it out explicitly for a potential. Okay? This is not an assignment, this is more for fun. That is what you do is you take a potential. Uh, I, I just checked it out before giving the course that uh, you take it for a constant acceleration, <coughs> mgx potential. And then what you do is that in that potential you solve this equation and you plot, this is t and this is x, you plot lines of constant s, that is where the phase is constant. Okay, you calculate the phase and you calculate lines of constant s for a given value of energy. Then you change e slightly because you are doing numerically, you can add an epsilon and take a small, small increment. And you plot the same constant values, you'll find that it goes something like this. And there are points in which it doesn't change. And that is where the phases constructively interfere and gives you a trajectory. And this trajectory will actually be some t is equal to root x. So it will actually emerge out of your graphics if you actually do it with Mathematica, etc. It's quite a nice thing to, fun thing to do. So the reason this, this is equated to a new constant is very mysterious in the standard canonical transformation because that is done in order to use this as a generating function and you put the new Hamiltonian to zero so that new x and t's are constants, okay? But here it is very obvious because it is just the phase which is solving. Okay, now there is just one more topic which I wanted to cover today and then we will break. That topic is relatively simple, but for the sake of completeness, let me do that. So far, we have done the definition of path integral. Then I got it to a wave function. Then I solved the wave function, I wrote down the differential equation satisfied by the wave function, which, is, which turns out to be the Schrodinger equation, right? So I have avoided uh, ever having to calculate a propagator, okay, by doing the sum. But at least there, are, there is a class of simple cases in which this propagator can be exactly computed. So I want to just uh, give you an indication. Again, the details of this I will throw in into the assignment. So the class in which it can be done is when this action happens to be quadratic or the Lagrangian happens to be quadratic. So we are talking about non-relativistic mechanics. So the Lagrangian has some half m x dot square, which is quadratic. Then the potential if it is alpha plus beta x plus gamma x square up to quadratic. You can also have an x x dot term even though it doesn't make too much of a difference. So x can only appear up to degree 2. If that happens, there is a simple way to compute that path. So let me just illustrate that. The way you do that is the following. You have this g which is sum over all paths x of t of this exponential i over a over h cross a for this x of t. What I am going to do is I am going to sum over all paths connecting two endpoints. So I am going to classif classify those paths by saying let x of t, any x of t be written as the classical path xc of t which you obtain by doing delta a is equal to 0, then plus a deviation which I call q of t. 
I am not assuming it is small, this is just q of t. And we had already argued that I can, I can either sum over x of t or I can sum over q of t. This goes for a right. This is like shifting uh, if I am doing integral dx minus infinity plus infinity, I can also do x plus 17 because that shift is going away. But here in order it not to contribute at the end point, I am going to assume that q vanishes at the end point. So q is 0 at both the end point. So that the classical path certainly satisfies the boundary condition, so everything is fine. So this is what we want to compute. So I want to go and plug into this x as xc plus q. What will happen? This action is quadratic. So when I expand it out, I will first get a value which is a for xc which I will call a classical, az. Then I should get a term which is linear in q. Then I should get a term which is quadratic in q. But the term linear in q will vanish because the coefficient of linear in q is exactly where the classical path gives you 0. Because how is classical path defined? Classical path is defined that if I make a small variation around that to the lowest order, to the linear order, the action does not change. So linear term will vanish. Then you will get a a which I will call quadratic which will only depend on q because all the coefficients should be constant if this is a quadratic action. Therefore, I find that my g can be written as when I do all the sum over paths. Now the sum is over q. First, I get e to the i over h cross a classical evaluated between the two endpoints. Then I have a sum over all q of t of e to the i over h cross the action evaluated for q which will be the quadratic part of the action. I will put quad here. You might think that this is not got us any, anywhere because you still have to do this sum. You do not. The point is that this sum when you do, we do not know what it is, but when you do this sum, this particular set of paths all have q equals 0 at the end points. So whatever it is, this is only going to be a function of the end point times. So I can replace this by some function n of t2 comma t1. In contrast, this is going to depend on x2 and t2 and it is going to depend on x1 and t1. So these are the even, but this is going to be this. So we have done our first summation over paths. If the action is quadratic, the propagator has an extremely simple form. It is some function of t2 comma t1 multiplied by exponential i x cross times the classical action computed for the classical path. So you take the action, find the classical path, compute the classical, uh, uh, classical action and that gives you the, this factor and then you multiply by an n of t2. Of course, we still have to determine n. I will come to it in a minute. Okay? But at least all the spatial dependence is coming from this. This does not have any spatial dependence. How do you determine n? To determine n, you go back to the condition which g was supposed to satisfy. I wrote it down and rubbed it out, so I will I'll do it once again. g x2 x g x x1 integrated over d3 x is equal to g of x2 comma x1. Now you plug this in, plug this form of the action into that, then you evaluate that. Most of the time that evaluation is somewhat involved algebraically, but it is much simpler than having to do a functional integral or summing over all paths. So you evaluate that, on the both sides you will have this n factor. And then that n will satisfy an equation which when you solve, you will determine what the n is. So if the action is quadratic, then there is a set procedure by which you can figure out what the path integral and the propagator is. What if the action is not quadratic? Then you are stuck. This is the major problem with the path integral approach that most of the non-trivial theories, I mean any good theory which has interactions, action will not be quadratic. 
So you cannot evaluate path integral exactly. You can use approximation techniques and all that, but you cannot evaluate the path integral exactly in any of the realistic theories. That is why we want to go back to Schrodinger equation or description in terms of fields, etc., etc., because that is technically much more powerful than the path integral, even though path integral is conceptually much nicer. Okay, and it gives you some intuitive ideas which you can't get otherwise. Yeah, that is a good place to stop for the day. Yes. If you do it like this, it is definitely finite. This for quadratic. So for a in general case, you have to give me a prescription as to how to write down the sum over path. Now that depends on what is known as a measure. Now this is a major problem in mathematics, but for actions which are of the form half m x dot square or some, some kinetic energy term and a potential energy term, when it is separable like that, then one can prove rigorously that there is a measure for which the sum is finite. Yeah, but there is an indirect way in which it can be proved, which I will do later on in the course, that we have shown that the sum over paths is equivalent to this differential equation. So what you are finding out is just the propagator for this differential equation, because G also satisfies this equation. So all that you want to do is to study the properties of a differential equation and ask when the solutions are finite. That is a very well understood and tractable problem and you will find that for most of the cases. In fact, it, for all cases in which this can be written down, it is uh, it is finite. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. How would the linear terms vanish if they are? Oh, okay. So let us go through this argument once again. Suppose it is uh, let us say it is uh, uh, half x dot square. Then you will have half x dot square, half q dot square, half x classical dot square, and half q dot square. Then you will have a term which involves uh, q and q dot and x dot. But that is exactly what you compute when you are doing this variation. See the x, this x, this ac and this xc is not arbitrary. This is the classical path. It satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equation. So how did you derive Euler-Lagrange equation? We said that when I vary this to a linear order, a should not change. So if there is a linear term in it, it will change. Therefore, the linear term cannot exist. That is how it just goes away. Yeah. Right. Right. Because in non-relativistic mechanics, you assume that given, uh, again, I have rubbed out that equation, given a wave function at one time, then the propagator will give you the wave function at another time. If that has to hold, this equation has to hold. This equation will hold only if every path cuts an intermediate point at only one point. So a path which goes back and forth will break this equation. This equation, in fact, does not hold if you try it for a relativistic particle. But what I'm asking is physically what happens in relativity so that you allow such a path? Oh, in physically what happens in relativity is that you can generate uh, particles when there was originally no particle. For example, one way of interpreting, it is not a, it's not a extremely rigorous interpretation, but you will see it in textbooks, so I might as well mention it to you, that if you have a path like this in relativity, what you will say is that at, here was a particle, then at this place, a particle-antiparticle pair was created, and this antiparticle sort of annihilated with this, and this particle went over there. Okay. So this business of generating particles and killing particles, you, can, you are not allowed to do in non-relativistic mechanics. So then this expression, which is non-relativistic, this. Correct. This is equivalent to number conservation, or rather it is equivalent to a wave function conservation, and the wave function can be defined only if number is fixed. Any other questions? Sir, yeah. For what? I mean, in, in the calculation of uh, yeah, classical trajectory. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can take the negative root as well. Then so the momentum sign, momentum sign will just I'm change. Sorry. So the, the phase changes. The phase becomes negative. So it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any it difference. Any it is. It is. Ex it doesn't have any physical meaning. It is just having one momentum p and another momentum p. That's See, essentially, integral over dx, you are changing the sign. 
So, if you change x to minus x here or something like that, it is equivalent to changing the sign of p. So, whether the particle is going along positive x or oh, negative. Sir, I am not talking about that. Hmm. So, when you were, uh, when, you, when you expand, when you said uh, s has a form e into t minus t 0 plus f. That is correct. So, that, so that f, you can put plus or minus there yeah. and it will not change anything. Not change. Right. So, there is a, there is not any time integral there dq. There is not, yes. That is correct, this contains time. So, in fact, that is why this is such a powerful constraint. You see, the, the it is good you brought it up. What I what happens here is that for those who probably did not grasp it, this x1 is x1 and t1. This is x2 and t2. This is x and t. This is x and t. So, you integrate over x, so x disappears, fine. But there is a t here and t here. But the left hand side is independent of t. Okay? So, that is a very strong constraint on what kind of functions you can have which will do this. Okay. In fact, if it is a free particle and you assume that it depends only on the separation because it is a free particle, it can depend only on x2 minus x1 and t2 minus t1 and you use this condition, you can immediately show that the action should have a particular form. That is right. It does not have a time reversal symmetry. Well, it actually has because if you change time reversal, psi becomes psi star. Because t going to minus t is same as i if you change the i to minus i. Yeah. Right. That is equivalent to time reversal invariance is equivalent to complex conjugation. Okay. If psi is a solution, psi star when you are looking at it as a solution, if this was not there and you are looking at stationary states with E psi or something because you guys have all done some quantum mechanics, E psi or something, then if psi is a solution, so will be psi star. But if there is an i h cross d by d t, if I change complex conjugation, then this i will pick up a minus i, then you have to change t to minus t. So, in some sense, the time reversal invariance is built in because psi and psi star contains the same information. Any other comments? Can Question? I do it by varying R, there was R, so we have to do varying. Right. The point is that the classical trajectory emerges because phases destructively interfere. The amplitude actually goes for a ride. The equation I wrote down for the amplitude is just a conservation law. See, it has d by dt of R square. What is R square? R square is just mod psi square. So, it is the probability. So, it is d by dt of d rho plus uh, its flow. That is all which happens. Okay, we'll break there.